details. We'll have John Giles coming up as always at half past seven. And Kevin Kilban is still alive. There's been search parties sent out. People were getting worried that we just got rid of Kilban, that we replaced him with some of the better options, Stephen Hunt and Cole Commentary. Mm. We've Johnny Walters coming up in Cole Commentary on Sunday. Well, wow. So we don't really have as much space for Kilban, but he is going to come in with his dog yet again. He'll be with us from eight o'clock and he's going to join us for the football show as well. He's watched a lot of Nations League football over the past week. A binge. I'm still not 100% sure that he actually understands what's going on. He's bringing the dog in though. He is. Class. That's all we need to know. If there's such a thing as a, like a Nations League binge, it's now a thing that actually exists, you know? Just like people watch, mm. you know, there's certain sporting events, like there's a March Madness and stuff like that. There's certain sporting events that people like binge watch it. People, I mean, how many Nations League games could you have watched last week if you put your mind to it? Well, you can definitely watch... Is there two a day? Although, does, is there a five no, o'clock every think, day? No, Monday, there wasn't a five day. o'clock. There no. was a three o'clock at one stage in Kazakhstan. Yeah, they, they, and the Slovakia Czech Republic was yeah. an early kickoff as well. Saturday, they've three games. You can watch three games back to back. I'm sure you uh, really dream. enjoyed my commentary of Romania, Serbia on Virgin Media Sport on Sunday. What's Bucharest uh, like at this time of year? Oh, it was warm. It was, was 25 it degrees. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did, did you introduce degrees. by saying you're very welcome to the stadium here? It was... Uh, it, I, listen, it was... You were there. I was, I was, was there. I was there. Of course, was, yeah. I sent, sent the pictures. Virgin Media had the big uh, money now. It was a scoreless draw, which at the time was the fourth The crowd were a bit restless there, were they? Fourth consecutive scoreless draw I'd commentated on. Oh. So I was, in, in a way, if I seem how happy did, to see that goal fly in for Harry Wilson. How, how did you cope with the, the fireworks and the smoke that was going on before the well, game? Because I know you no, that, for that wasn't intervene. just That wasn't before the game. That was actually after the game started. Okay. So the game was on for about 30 seconds. Surely and that would it was a break for a good four MP, minutes. That impede your so view. I was, I was, well, not really. Myself and Gary Breen had a good good view from our Well, Breen our were over seat. as well. Yeah, yeah. Pick well, I don't nice, go anywhere without Gary. Not any nice restaurants over in Brookcrest. Yeah, all the good stuff, Richie. I can send you on some recommendations. Could you? Because I was thinking of doing a bit of a trip there. Pretty nice, yeah. This time of year, 20 odd degrees. It was game so there I watched uh, I, I saw a very early game so I think I've seen five nations you've seen League five games. and you, I mean you've been to five oh, different this. countries to do them as well <laughs> this is the thing this <laughs> I mean, is the thing well stamped passport for Nathan uh, that is Dan McDonald who's with us once again this evening how are you hi Nathan and Richie McCormick who's got his what are we Luther Mateus Italia 90 training top yeah. is that a training top that's why you say Luther as if you're uh, Jimmy McGee because he could never say Luther it's Luther Mateus What's wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that at all. You're in good company. Where did you get that? Tell me. The the internet. Mm. Is that an original or is that a Repro. Adidas remake? Remake from the last couple of years. How much that cost you? Enough. Go on. Enough. I would say 80 quid. No. Oh, less. Less? less? Yeah, it was less. Yes. Yeah. You have the internet, so I mean... Yeah, I guess so. Uh, the news round brought to you this evening with Screwfix.ie championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products. Uh, so we're going to talk about Martin O'Neill's comments which were, you sort of teed them up last night that they were interesting. So the way post-match works for a manager is he does his live interviews on Sky and RTE, yeah. and then he goes into his press conference, the which auditorium. all the radio are there, and we can ask our questions and we can use straight away. And then he goes off around the back, and we never know quite what happens, but I always see you guys going, there's a very much a firm, you're not allowed in here, not no radio, not, not happening. No, put your microphones away. And yeah. the, uh, the entire estate looks at me and with disgust. So what, what happened with Martin O'Neill? Yeah, well, I think you know it was it was covered across the papers today, and a couple of key sound bites, I guess. Um, well, you know, it, was, it actually started off really as normal, to be honest. The the the, the post match, you know, generally you ask him, you try and ask a few more questions with a view to bringing things on because it's published the day after, you know. So more so looking ahead to next month and well, what happens from here. But I, I guess at a certain point, I mean, to be fair, I like, you know, the post match interview for a manager after a defeat is difficult. You know, it is, there's naturally emotions are heightened and it is the time where people you know Kevin Keegan style can lash out or go a particular way and you're and just trying to wind a little well, bit to get well, the reaction and get the line I'm not sure if that was the intention but I think certainly what needed to be asked after the other day now I was actually more to the back of this huddle so I'm not going to take credit for any questions that were asked but the, the you know generally I think there had to be questions with regard to the future I mean and his future because I mean, that's what people are asking. Like, you Just know, tell it, me how we got to a situation where Martin O'Neill is saying, I will win. Because I'm Why? good. Because I'm good. Yeah, well, I don't know. At one point, someone asked a question saying, listen, had you discussed your position with the FAI in the context of, like, did it, will the Nations League affect your position? Or words to that effect. And uh, it was sort of a politely phrased question, and he answered that. But then, uh, you know, he gave a very positive response in the affirmative about how he plans to deliver and that led to a bit more probing well you know when are you going to deliver 
Um, and then from that we went to, I, I'll win. I didn't quite pick it up what he was saying at first, but I was like, I'll win. It was like a, a two-word answer. And I was like, what did he just say there? I'll win. So then, In fact, he said I rather than we. You know, that was the thing. You know, it's, I will win. I will prevail, you know. Um, In spite of all you. So a couple more questions. And then again, uh, in the context of another answer, he just said, I'll win. I'll win again. And then he's along the lines of, we'll go through. That's for sure. Go through where? Uh, to, you know, to the Euros. Are you talking about the Euros? And just to clarify, this is the kind of thing that's harder to do when there's a microphone being passed around. Like, do you mean the, the finals of 2020? Absolutely. Are you sure? Yeah. Why? Because I'm good. And was it a happened then? Kind of sense, no, or? no, no. It was sternly delivered within a two, you know, it was, it was straight back. It wasn't like, uh, because I'm good. It was like, no, because I'm good. And that was it. And you could just see people like, well, this is, right, this is, this is interesting. Martin this was the, uh, and, and it wasn't like madly under pressure. It was more sort of confident, mm. cocky, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it was effectively him saying, I'm the manager. I will, I will get it done. That's it. And my view, and I sort of touched on it in the piece today, is that sometimes you see Martin O'Neill at, at, at close quarters and you realise sort of he is a strong sort of authoritative figure. You know, there's no point really where we've seen Martin O'Neill, I don't think, hugely rattled. We've seen him in, mm. and, and everyone I think will have seen him in post-match interviews, maybe the RT one, uh, a bit tetchy and, and, you know, getting into a bit of a... A, a sort of verbal sort of tennis thing, but never really, I don't think, rattled to the sense no. where he's like, you he's go, still getting his message across. Yeah, he, he's never walked out of a room and you've thought, God, he's, he's broken tonight. You know, he, he's, he's, he fights fire with fire, I guess. And this was, uh, this was him taking that view. And my view would be, can you imagine like the FAI board or someone trying to come in and say to Martin, well, you know, we're not really happy with results at the moment. He's a sort of a stronger character than anyone that mm. we would be in that room with. You know, he's got absolute belief in himself. All the stuff about Forrest. Tell me who's going to do a better job. Well, that, that's exactly what the who's line would be. going to do a better be. job? That's what the line would be. What have I done? You know, he will give it out. And he's got, he's a commanding figure. Like, you forget that people talk about Roy Keane like being this hugely in, intimidating presence. Uh, Martin O'Neill is probably, I mean, Roy Keane, by all accounts, sort of falls in line with Martin O'Neill. He says, yeah. You know, Martin O'Neill is the Just boss. One of the more interesting parts of the uh, so dynamic. He has the strength of character to hold him, you know? All right, we are going to come back to that and a lot more with. Dan and with Kev on the football show and also with John Giles in a minute but I want to turn to matters somewhat more serious because this afternoon a 21 year old Italian man Filippo Lombardi was found not guilty of causing grievous bodily harm to Sean Cox outside Anfield in Liverpool earlier this year New Sox Frank Graney joins us on the line he was at Preston Crown Court today Frank can you tell us what happened in court this afternoon well, at about three o'clock this afternoon, uh, Nathan, the judge called the men and women of the jury back into Court 10 at Preston Crown Court and to give them the majority verdict direction. They had been deliberating for just under nine hours. They were sent out to begin their deliberations yesterday afternoon. And the judge told them that at that point, he would accept a majority verdict. They returned to their jury room, but they were back in the courtroom a couple of minutes later. And they had arrived at a majority verdict and they found Mr. Lombardi at not guilty um, of inflicting serious uh, bodily harm, grievous bodily harm uh, on Sean Cox. We all know the aftermath and the devastating effects that that had on Mr. Cox. He is now still in hospital. He's in the National Rehabilitation um, Unit in uh, Dunleary. And um, we've heard during the trial that he suffered severe uh, brain injuries when he was punched and knocked unconscious outside Anfield. And that was ahead of a clash between Liverpool and Rome in the Champions League last April. So this incident has obviously garnered a huge amount of attention and it was such a horrific situation that Sean Cox, a completely innocent party, and I guess so many people can relate to going to matches and just walking around, enjoying the stadium, having a look around, and then to get attacked in such an unprovoked manner. People want to see justice. As you say, he suffered catastrophic injuries, severe brain injury. He's going to face a lifetime of care. His wife has been talking in the papers that the costs may come up to €2 million, Euro, that they're looking at major fundraising efforts so that Sean Cox can get the best possible treatment going forward. But also, everybody wants to see justice. What happens from here so that the family get justice, that the person who inflicted these injuries on Sean Cox is found? 
It's a very good question. And I suppose one thing that was apparent throughout the uh, trial and one thing that was accepted by both sides was the punch that knocked uh, Sean Cox to the ground um, wasn't actually delivered by Mr Lombardi. That was delivered by a man in court. That was described. He was never identified, but he was described as N40. And we heard that a man has been arrested um, in relation to to that punch. And he was arrested in Italy and he is facing extradition proceedings. That's all the jury was told uh, in relation to that. Mr Lombardi was um, acquitted this afternoon. But let's not forget that he did plead guilty to a lesser charge of uh, violent disorder. And he was sentenced to three years in prison uh, for that. The footage that was shown throughout the trial, this is footage that was pieced together from CCTV cameras um, mounted on the cop, uh, which is where, just behind the cop, is where where this um, incident took place. There was also footage from fans that were going to the game. The footage itself was frightening. You see Liverpool fans um, walking up the street towards uh, the stadium. Everyone was in good form. We heard that Sean Cox was there with his brother Martin. They had their arms around each other. They were laughing. They were joking. They were looking forward to the game. And then all of a sudden, from Vermont Street... About 30 uh, Roma fans dressed in black, blue jeans and white trainers, all with their hoods up, some with their faces covered, some with weapons um, like belts. Mr Lombardi armed himself uh, with a belt and they just flood into this scene and then chaos ensues and obviously uh, that assault on Mr uh, Cox took place. When you talk about justice, Mr Lombardi has been sentenced to three years in prison. There's another man who has been sentenced to two and a half years in prison and let's wait and see if this man who was arrested in connection uh, with the same incident is extradited and brought before a court in um, England in, in due course but their main and Mr Cox's wife was there his son was there family members were there throughout they didn't make a comment afterwards but clearly they were very disappointed uh, mm. by today's outcome uh, their focus is on 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 Sean Cox we heard from Martin Cox who gave evidence last week um, that he is unable to talk still all these months later. He can only whisper. He can't sit himself up in the bed. He needs assistance to do that. So all of their attention will be now on this 12-week rehabilitation program uh, that he is undergoing. And like you mentioned, the fundraising efforts must continue as well because he's going to need an awful lot of care going forward. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Frank Graney there of News Talk, who was at Preston Crown Court today. And of course, we will keep you updated on any of the fundraising efforts. We've had some people from Dumbo and GA on the show over the last couple of weeks. And anything that's happening over the next little while, we will let people know. Because I know people around the country really do want to support the Cox family. So... Richie, where are we starting in the news round? We'll start with Buenos Aires. Happier news from there. Sean McCarthy Crean secured Ireland's third medal of the Youth Olympics this evening. The Cork teenager claimed a bronze by reaching the semi finals of the plus 68 kg Kumite Karate. McCarthy Crean was beaten by Morocco's Nabil Esh Shabi in his semi final within the past hour. Last night, Leitrim Featherweight Dervil Rooney won a bronze by beating New Zealand's Tamania Shelford Edmonds on a unanimous decision in the boxing, and that followed Neve Coyne's silver in the pool, which came last week. So the indoor football final was on earlier. Brazil against Russia. There was uh, quite an own goal from one of the Russian players. The ball was crossed over from the left-hand side, came to the Russian defender, who just smashed it into the top corner in that he'd had a complete sort of... Brain fart. Brain fart yeah. and thought he was scoring down the opposite way. Uh-huh. At first, I just thought, God, this is the calmest man I've ever met. <laughs> He's just scored in the final of the Youth Olympics and there was no celebration whatsoever. So indoor football, you say, was it? Mm. Yeah. Oh, I, I've, I've completely missed this in the Ireland cycle. There's actually indoor football. Mm. Yeah, indoor football. It did get me thinking, though, because at first it was like, is this one of these situations where he's playing against his former team and he's not celebrating? Are we going to get to a situation with football or rugby where there's so many players who grew up in different countries playing for another country that they won't celebrate against the country they were born in? Oh, that would be an extreme, an extreme turn of events. I, I don't know. It would it, happen, though. Like, well, Diego the Costa. Costa. So CJ Sander scores a try against South Africa and he just gets up and goes, no, 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 no. No, no celebrations here. Declan Rice comes back and he scores a last-minute winner against England. Oh, no, no, no. Declan no. Rice. No. If Declan Rice... Callum Robinson scores against England. No, no. Yeah, 29 underage caps yeah. for England. I'm no sure celebrations here. No, I, I don't think that would be a that'd be a new level. Like, I mean, I, I don't Qatar have an entire inter- international team, basically? Uh, Mostly Brazilians. Sort of imported mm. in. Yeah. So if they ended up playing Brazil at the World Cup, would they be in a really difficult... Imagine yeah. the opening game, playing their host country. Everybody the singing Cup. the one national anthem. Yeah. Yeah, definitely the anthem. I kind of wonder if players ever made the mistake of just, like, coming along <laughs> with their own anthem, you Didn't, know? Uh, a was certain was Irish international at the playoff final? Uh, yes, yeah. that was. Which, uh, Roy Keane wrote up in his book. Yeah. I mean, we can, can we say who it is? Everyone knows, surely. Former, sometime guest on the show. Scored against Cameroon. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah, you can, people can guess who that might be. Yeah. His surname is also a country. Listen, he was humming along. He That's thought it was a catchy tune. It happens, yeah. But I mean, I think that the World Cup in the summer wasn't there something that the, the amount of French-born players in the tournament was outrageously large. Now, I know sort of France's history is a bit more complex mm. in terms of, you know, the, the various communities there. But I don't know if the Marseille is playing, are they just going to hum along to it? Oh, you would yeah. anyway. Yeah, that's the thing. It's maybe more excusable. Yeah. <laughs> when home along to God Save the Queen, you've got serious problems. <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah, real catchy tune that. I really like that, you know. That, that excuse wasn't going to wash with Roy. No, definitely not. And I just got, got caught up in the moment. I just really like the lyrics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not really going to work. If you listen yeah. to them deeply. If you yeah. listen to them deeply, you know, there's real meaning there. Shane Finnegan is watching us on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Evening, Shane. Is Richie just coming from indoor soccer in the 1980s? Oh, that's harsh now. That's harsh. Not that old. Not as old as Nathan. Uh, five Munster players have been rewarded with contract extensions. New deals for Chris Farrell and Chris Cluto will see them remain with the province Work until at least the summer of 2022. Uh, while Tommy O'Donnell, Neil Cronin and James Cronin have all signed two-year deals that run to June 2021. Meanwhile, another player will be making the switch from Leinster to Munster in the summer. Scrum half Nick McCarthy is to follow in the footsteps of Joey Carberry at the end of this term. A first round 69 leaves Shane Larry on two under par at a weather-affected Andalusia Masters in Valderrama. As things stand, the Claremont is three shots adrift of leader England's Ashley Chesters. The threat of lightning had called a halt to play for over two hours there this afternoon. Padraig Harrington and Gavin Moynihan are both level and are among 60 players that will have to complete their first rounds tomorrow morning. But Larry feels he's in a position to compete this week. You know, the last sort of couple of months have been good and since uh, you know, since I went over after the Open, since I went to kind of America there and I played a few good weeks and, um, you know, last week was kind of one of those weeks where I didn't really get anything going and I did well to make the cut and managed to finish middle of the pack. But um, I'm definitely coming here this week to try and contend, try and compete and look... Uh, there's a long way to go. It's going to be a long week because there's storms forecast for the rest of the week and um, I just have to get out there when I get the chance and try and hit some good shots. Dunny Gold's Jason Quigley puts his NABF middleweight title on the line in California in the small hours of tomorrow morning. El Animal takes on Freddy Hernandez in the small hours around about 3 o'clock in Indio. The fight will be Quigley's second under trainer Dominic Ingle and sees Quigley looking to improve on his record uh, to 15 and 0. But speaking with Highland Radio last night, Quigley is in confident mood. There hasn't been one fight or one fighter that I've been in with yet that I felt like I'm in against it here. Do you know what I mean? Like this lad is my biggest test to date. He has been to higher levels than this, than fighting me. You know what I mean? He's fought for the world title. He's uh, been in with great fighters, and uh, this is a step up for me. It's going to be a great test for me. But uh, you know, I'm 110 percent confident, feeling very good, feeling very strong, and uh, just weighing in and looking at him in his eyes you know what I mean I just see uh, I see a man that's that's there for the taking If Jason Quigley didn't have enough to worry about in fighting Freddie Hernandez tonight he's going to step straight out of the ring and straight onto a Skype call with Adrian Barry on OTB AM tomorrow morning from 7.45 It's a tough bout that's that's, That is dedication That is agreeing to a post-fight interview before the, post, the fight even happens that's Confident. what I'd like to see. Dedica- it's confidence. It is confidence. That's the I will win mentality that Mark I, Neal likes. I will win. Because I'm good. That is one of those comments that is going to be brought up again and again and again. That was the thing. So we draw our opening game of the proper qualifiers, as we call them. Martin, do you still think you're going to win? Yeah. You That's said a, you will win. But, but, you know, it's the kind of definitive it? statement that sort of it does follow your end. I did. I if, did he does, think if he does win, though, can you imagine? Oh. Uh, it'll be a golden cleric speech practically when he's when he's <laughs> in Ireland have qualified. Top know? of the list, Dan, yeah, you will yeah. be quite oh, near no, it. No, I won't be. No, a few in this building, I would say, would definitely be definitely, uh, I think, quite yeah. near it. One of them, I think, was on this afternoon. Now you can check out his show now online. He could be top. <laughs> he could I be think. top of the list yeah. right now. Uh, I, I was searching for positives when I went home on Tuesday night and again went into the the uh, fun fair that is the Nations League Wikipedia page and working things out again. And it is practically impossible not to reach a playoff if you're in the top two leagues. And also we have pretty a Pretty hard. It's pretty hard not to, but the wor- yeah, it, 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 there's a fair chance, yeah. But there's, there's a fair chance we end up in that four-team playoff in March 2020. The problem is we could end up against quite a good team. Yeah, I think it's it's basically, yeah, to explain it, it's your, si- your seeding position is still going to be bad mm. if you're the, the worst you do in the Nations League. So more chance of a tougher playoff still. But yeah, it is true, March 2020, we could still be in the Euros. Yeah, I think there's every chance we will be. Yeah. So, 
That's something to look forward to. That's a long way away. Yes. So Martin O'Neill will still be there, though. He, he will playoffs. still be. But that's thing he'll still be able to say, "I will win." And I got to the playoffs. Mm. The entire Christmas would be four month build up to a playoff. It's normally a month. It'd be four oh, yeah. months. Yeah. Four one months. legged, are they? One legged, yeah. Semi final and final. Oof. I'm not sure if they've decided would it all be in one venue or like, you know, home and away. And well, listen, we're going to run down through it all with Kev, and he's going to bring us through oh, all the possible yeah, permutations. We will bring clarity here. We can just get the dog <laughs> to do it. nine o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> the dog would be more used when it comes to the Nations League than Kev. Yeah. Uh, Burnley manager Sean Dyche says Robbie Brady is nearing a return to their first team. The Republic of Ireland wingers has been out since December after suffering a serious knee injury, and Burnley's won defeat away to Leicester. Brady played 90 minutes of a challenge match with AFC Files this week. But Dyche says Saturday's Premier League trip to Manchester City will come too soon for the Dubliner. Dyche gave an update on the fitness of Brady today, along with Stephen Ward, Belgium midfielder Stephen DeFore. But first, John Walters. That's settling. It's your longer term situation. Um, that's settling down. Wardy, unfortunately, has had a, a sort of a tidy up in, the, in his knee and a washout, if you like, on his knee. Um, we'll wait and see, you know, but that's not going to be days. Obviously, that's going to be weeks. Better news with Stephen. He got another 90 in earlier in the week, which is great. We managed to arrange a game just to make sure he's fit and well. Uh, Robbie came through that as well. Uh, 90 minutes his first 90 minutes actually because he's been close to 90 minutes and we just had to either take him off or he's just felt a little niggle uh, the last one was his hamstring but he was clear uh, that doesn't give him uh, that we're not going to clear him for this week or any of that but what I mean is he's, that's another great you know step forward so as we knew a long term injury for John Walters he needs to start thinking about other aspects of his life who he wants to spend his Sundays oh with oh god oh no. no he hasn't entered that competition has he oh, my god. that's right <laughs> That's right, John Walters <laughs> has won the chance to spend his Sunday afternoon with me. We're going to Goodison. As if a serious injury wasn't bad enough. I know, this is what, he, it'll, be a one, it'll be a one-off, I suspect. He'll you go, inhaling nah. eclairs at Goodison <laughs> right, on Sunday. Right now, he's thinking, he's done a bit of Sky Sports, he's done a bit of Five Live, I'll give off the ball a go, and then he'll probably decide, actually, this media yeah. career is, is not for me. So John Walters is with us, Goodison Park. It is Everton against Crystal Palace, 4 o'clock on Sunday. We have a few things to talk about in the stoppages. No, just, just the game. No, His family are all Everton fans as well, that's the thing. Well, that's, that's why I, I'd, been, yeah. I'd been targeting for a while, and I was always going, an Everton game, you know, Perfect. might be a nice yeah. place, just nearby. So he's finally finally responded and he has coming on Sunday of course we'll just talk about the game if he's listening in now we'll just talk about everything nothing else nothing else nothing else will come up that's not how it works all. that's not how it works at all uh, so that's Sunday uh, also something else that you know about is our next off the ball roadshow in association with Heineken Rugby Club we are going to be live from the Olympia Theatre on Tuesday November 13th we'll have an all star lineup of Ireland and All Blacks legends who will be revealing over the next few days get on to offtheball.com forward slash events right now to get your tickets it's the latest off the ball roadshow in association with Heineken Rugby Club and remember this event is for over 18s only visit drinkaware.ie an all star presenting lineup up as well I've got the boot hard to believe after that uh, wonder show down in Limerick, Limerick yeah. nothing, w- nothing went wrong with that I don't know what the problem is just wrong. leaving a high listen back to the edited version online now on offtheball.com it's about Shot. two minutes long it's, it's pretty short <laughs> cheers lads we'll talk to you again in a little while dancing around for the football show John Giles is up next Off the Ball on News Talk. thanks to screwfix.ie championing the trade with a choice of over 20,000 quality trade products Galileo! Galileo Figaro! Ah, yeah. Freddy's right. Can you go a bit higher, Ivan? If I go any higher, only dogs will hear me. Try. Galileo! Galileo Figaro! Higher. Ah, here. Come on. How many more Galileos do you want? Calm down, Ivan. There's only room in this band for one hysterical queen. Next Wednesday on The Hard Shoulder, to mark the release of Bohemian Rhapsody in cinemas, Henry McKean is on the hunt for Ireland's biggest Queen fan. So if you think you could be champion, break free and email me now on henry at newstalk.com. The Hard Shoulder with Ivan Yates. With Nissan. Weekdays from four on News Talk. Who is Galileo anyway? In popular imagination, when we have an idea, a light bulb goes off. So what happens when Audi has an idea? They're even brighter. Until November 30th, Audi's offering complimentary bulb replacement, including xenon bulbs, with every Audi expert service. At just €189, it also includes a year's roadside assistance and headlight focusing. See things in a new light. Book your Audi expert service today at audiservice.ie. 
At M&S, our Oakham Whole Chicken has a new lower everyday price of €4.50. And it's sourced from M&S Select Farms we know and trust. So now you can enjoy a quality whole Oakham chicken for a very tasty price. Same great quality, new lower price. M&S for less. See in store for details. So, item one, rebranding. What's the update, Michelle? All done. Within budget? Yes, we partnered with Snap. They handled all of it. Creative design and production, the printing, promo and signage and installation. And our online design changes? Snap rebranded everything. The entire nationwide project? Yes, Snap is the largest print design and promotional product group in Ireland. Over 70% of Ireland's top 1,000 companies trust Snap. Need a marketing partner with quality solutions? Talk to Snap. Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Mayo and Galway. Visit snap.ie. Bruce Betting, Sportsbook, Casino and now Live Casino. Download the Bruce Betting app to see why for the Premier League, Bruce Betting are giving you more. With price boosts, live in-play betting, cash out and ACA insurance. Make Bruce Betting your Premier League bookmaker. Bruce Betting, in store, online and now on your phone. Please gamble responsibly. See dunlui.net. At the Cork International Hotel, we really care about your business. Whether it's a conference, an event, or a meeting, we will ensure your business gets a standing ovation. Call our dedicated team today to discuss your next event in Cork's leading business hotel. Visit corkinternationalhotel.com. This week at Expert Electrical, when you purchase a Dyson V8 Animal or a Dyson V7 Motorhead, we'll give you a complete home cleaning accessory kit. Don't miss out, only while stocks last. With 67 stores nationwide, there's a local expert near you. Find yours at experts.ie. Terms and conditions apply. First man to walk on the moon. It'll be a hell of a ride. First man has critics rating. Three. Five stars. It's a blockbuster that's out of this world. It's an extraordinary cinematic achievement. It will take your breath away. Good luck. From the director of La La Land, Brian Gosling. We have serious problems. We've got this under control. Claire Foy. You don't have anything under control. It's the best movie of the year. Do you think you're coming back? First Man. In cinemas now. Certificate 12A. Football on Off the Ball. In association with the faster than ever Boil Sports app. With hundreds of pre-live and in-play football markets. Download it now. Boil Sports. Time to play. It is that time of a Thursday. John Giles is on the line. Evening, John. Evening, Nathan. So another deeply disappointing and frustrating week for the Republic of Ireland. Just the one point from the games at home against Denmark and Wales. We'll get into the details of what went wrong. But overall, looking at the two matches, what were the basic fundamentals that went wrong for Ireland? Well, quite a few, actually, (laughs) uh, Nathan. We didn't play at all well against Denmark. I think Denmark were lucky enough for us. We're satisfied with a point with a bit to go. Uh, we never got the ball. We never played on it. Uh, I thought we were lucky to get away with it on the night. It was a little bit better for, for against Wales. There was more life in it. I think Robinson made a difference coming on the pitch, bit of life up the pitch. Mayler was back in his proper position. Uh, so all those things helped uh, on the, on the, the, the second, for the second match. But overall, the two matches, you'd have to say, were very disappointing. Yeah, hugely frustrating, I think, for anybody who was at Lansdowne Road for the two games. We might start then on the team selections over the two matches. And I guess the most interesting and controversial part of the team selection was the inclusion of Cyrus Christie in the middle of midfield, which Martin O'Neill said was a decision he had to make, he felt, to maybe accommodate Matt Doherty as a wing-back. But Cyrus Christie said he'd never played in that game as a senior footballer. He hadn't played there probably since he was 14 years of age. How risky a move was that by O'Neill? Well, well, it was very risky. And, and it was a bit of a put down to, to Doherty playing. Uh, you know, that Christie was on uh, to look after him a little bit. I can't understand that. If you pick a lot for an international match playing, he's played in the, in the Premiership, he's played well. Uh, and it was, it was difficult to understand. It looked like to me that, uh, you know, Martin O'Neill was justifying his position, uh, his position over Christie because mm. he's played him ahead of a Doherty and, and it's been quite critical uh, of Doherty. Uh, so, I mean, when you, when you think of the players on the bench, you know, you had Myler on the pitch who was captain uh, only last year and wasn't playing. So, like, Christie's a good-hearted lad and he did okay. Mm. But, but it's a wing and a prayer. When you put somebody, any player in, uh, Nathan, whether it be full-back or goalkeeper, uh, who hadn't played in, well, not Gokey because he played in that position, or anybody else who didn't play in that position regularly, or had played, hadn't played in since he was 14, you couldn't possibly know what he's going to do. 
That's why you do preparation. That's why you have the players together during the week or you play them in a certain match and try them out maybe. But it's very, very difficult to understand. And Martin does this quite a bit. You know, he puts a player in and says, OK, off you go. Yeah, bit of a curveball. And we spend a lot of time on Thursday evenings talking about midfield play and what makes a good midfielder, what makes a great midfielder. And for Cyrus Christie, with that inexperience, we saw time and time again when he received the ball, he just didn't seem to have the confidence in himself or maybe the ability to be able to turn and face the opposition and raise his head. His first inclination every time, it seemed, was almost to go backwards, to take yeah. a simple pass. Yeah. So when you look at somebody coming in from a totally different position on the field, playing there for the first time, like how difficult a task is it? What are the basic skills when you watch Cyrus Christie of it's a midfielder very, that he was missing? It's very difficult, uh, Nathan, because... He's been playing all his career, as I can see, as a fullback. Mm. Now, you, you know by now what his best position is. I mean, what you'll find is if lads can play very, very well in midfield and also play well in midfield, they're much more valuable playing in mid midfield. So, Christie, that is definitely his position where, where he goes. And, and, and also in, that, in the particular match the other day, Hendrick was playing much and has been playing much further forward than he normally plays as a midfield player. You know, like Hendrick is, is, has been lost. He, well, he was back in position, I think, for the match uh, against Wales. And he yeah. played a lot better. But he was, he was pushed up ahead of Christie. I don't know what sort of formation it was supposed to be. But, but that's not Hendrick's position either. I mean, all you can do as a manager, you go back to the basics. You've got a group of players and you play them, the best players, in the best position. Yeah. That's usually the, 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 the best tactic that you can do. Never mind 4-3-3 three, three and 5-2, whatever formation you're talking about. Play your best players in your best position. And if, if Doherty deserved to be in the team ahead of Christie, that doesn't mean Christie has to be in the team. I mean, you've got Hendrick, there's a couple of midfield players that could play, I would say, would have proven to be playing better than Christie in middle field because nobody knew how Christie was going to play. Yeah. Now, Christie is a good-hearted lad. There's no doubt about that. I didn't do much wrong over the two games either. But that's, you know, you, he's a fullback. His mm. best position is fullback. Yeah, you'd wonder what it does for the confidence as well of some of those midfielders, like David Myler, who must be wondering what's got on, considering he was pretty much man of the match in Cardiff in the win a year ago, and as yeah. since he was taken off at half time against Denmark, has barely seen any time yeah. in the pitch at all, and you see a right back coming in to take her place. Yeah. Well, it looks like a Myler, a Myler's guy, so I'd be thinking, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm being blamed here for the first half uh, against Wales last year, because he was captain, as you say, and he played a lot of good matches before that. Well, he played mm. really well. He played in. He, he played at right back at one stage. And he was he was a, a good all round player. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, to be honest, I don't know what he'd be thinking at the moment, uh, Nathan. Do you just trust though the way that Martin O'Neill talks about his players that he understands the dressing room that by almost giving them a kick up the ass at times that maybe he feels that's the method of motivation that works than rather than putting a hand around their shoulders or does it seem a little bit unusual? Well, it, it, it can take all sorts of different things, uh, Nathan. But in my experience, the best way you do that is in the privacy of the dressing room. And nobody knows about it. You, know, mm. you can give a player a telling off when it's between you and the manager. And uh, that's it. I mean, the manager's giving it to you there and then. It's between you and him. And, and he, what he wants to get the best out of you. But I've never seen a, a player, uh, the manager get the best out of a player by doing it in a public way. Never. Never seen it. I mean, I've seen dressing room telling offs. I've had them. Yeah. Uh, but nobody knows anything about them. And, but, it, I mean, to get to the point, does it help? I don't, no, I don't think it helps. Done privately, you can get the biggest telling off you can get. And it really, really can be really hurtful. But publicly, you don't have to do it publicly, Nathan. Definitely not. The lack of goals is becoming a greater and greater issue. And you look back over the last 18 months, Ireland have played Denmark twice at the Viva Stadium. They've welcomed Wales to Dublin twice. They've played Serbia. They've played Austria. Those six games against pretty decent quality opposition, yeah. they've scored two goals. Now, the obvious answer, and Martin O'Neill bring this up, is that Robbie Keane and his 68 international goals aren't there anymore. Is it up to Martin O'Neill, though? Is it his job to find another way? Because at the moment, it seems he's just looking at Shane Long and Aidan O'Brien and Shawnee McGuire and Scott Hogan and saying, well, these guys aren't up to it, so what else can you expect? Well, I, I think there's a way to approach it. I mean, what Martin is saying publicly is, or what I get the feeling is, we're doing everything well apart from scoring goals. Well, I don't think that's the case. I don't think we're doing everything well apart from scoring goals. Of course, you need goal scorers, but it doesn't mean you have to, to concede goals as well. Nathan, you know, because I've seen plenty of teams who didn't have good goal scorers, but they don't concede goals. So there's, mm. there's different elements of the, 
of the team. You've got the, the, the defenders, you've got a goalkeeper, defenders, you've got midfield players. Uh, you know, they all help to create goals. I don't, I don't think we've been creating a lot of goals. So players could say, oh, God, if, if, if Robbie Keane, he would have taken that particular chance. You know, that don't get lads up front, the new lads coming in. Uh, like Robinson was good. I thought there was plenty of life about him the other day in, in the second match. But I don't think you could look at any of these players that have come in and say, oh, he missed two or three chances yeah. in a match, or he missed two or three chances. I mean, against uh, um, Denmark the other night, I don't know if we created one chance for anybody to miss. No, it's hard to remember, remember yeah, any even one, real even moment one of one notes. Say, well, if Robbie Keane had been there, he was scoring. Mm. I think what Martin is saying, general, he's making general statements. We don't have a Robbie Keane, so therefore we're not scoring goals. But what about midfield? Midfield are not playing well to make the goals. Well, that's what that, that was the point I wanted to ask you on. Yeah. So you talked there about looking at teams down through the years who didn't have a great goal scorer, but mm. still managed to score goals. So what well, are they doing they that we're not doing? Just second. What about the World Cup? Mm. Giroud For, didn't score a goal yeah. in the World Cup. But they played well and other players scored goals. So that would be the perfect example. In a World Cup and the centre-forward gets a, a winner's medal, it's everything so from Giroud's point of view, but he didn't score. So you can have all-round players that can, that can come in and score. We haven't been missing chances. This is the point uh, that, that I, I make all the time, that you couldn't say, well, if Robbie Keane was there, he would have scored that. There's quite a few more bits and pieces I want to get to over the couple of games, John. It sounds as though everything you're talking about, though, almost comes down to organisation, because you mentioned the lack of chances against Denmark. The one sort of half chance that Ireland had was that shot from 20 yards out from Cyrus Christie that was well saved by Schmeichel. And that came from the one time, I think, in the entire game where Shane Long won the header and actually knocked it down to one of his teammates who was standing only seven, eight yards behind and was flicked out quickly to the wing. And even that long ball game that you might associate with Quinn and Keane, that, that felt like it was something that was worked on a lot, that there was an understanding between Quinn and Keane. Yeah, the they knew where they were, where, where that just yeah, doesn't seem to be that there. Wasn't, that was... That, that was a long, long ball game, but it was it was constructive long mm. ball. See, there's a difference between knocking it to, to uh, say, uh, Shane Long now, on his own, up the pitch, with little chance of getting, even getting ahead. And even if he did get on a head, a head on it, uh, Nathan, it, it's, it, there's nobody there to support him, and he can't do anything about it. Whereas when Quinn played with Keane, they, these, these were long balls, but they were constructive balls to, to Quinn's head, knocked on to Keane. That, that was, there's nothing wrong with that. That's That's... There's a difference between a long ball game where it's constructive and, yeah. go, and you're doing something right, rather than hitting long balls out of defence where the centre forward in long, it's in long's case, in long case with Ireland, no chance of doing anything. That's where you need the players, uh, you know, to, to combine from the midfield to make it uh, for the lads up front, make it easier. Uh, but it, it, it's it's. It's a, it's can be, a long ball game can be a very effective if it's a constructive long ball, mm. Nathan. But if it's just knocked out from the back, then it's it's playing Sean Long has no no chance. Yeah. The main thing as well, Nathan, is picking the right players in the right position. You know, you talk about tactics, long ball, short ball, whatever it might be. But basically, you're going back to playing your best players in your best position, and it goes back to, to Hendrick. And for example, playing forward of where he normally plays, mm. Christie playing in midfield where he's not really a midfield player, uh, all that type of thing. You have to start with the basic thing is, pick your best players in the best position, and then you go and play. And yeah. you, you play in a, constructive, in a constructive manner. And you get up the pitch together, you get down the pitch together, back the pitch together. That's the way it works. I know, I know I'm getting a little bit uh, technical here, I don't mean to be, but that's the way it works in football. You have to go back to the basics. Best players in the best position, encourage them to play. I mean, the other day, if you go, I'd say Christie was out of position, Hendrick was out of, definitely out of position in, 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 in the middle of the field. And Robinson, when he came on to help Long, was, was, was a big help. All right, John, we're going to take a very quick break, but I want to get your thoughts on the goal and the manner in which we conceded the goal, and also Martin O'Neill's future, whether he should stay or whether he should go. But we'll get into all of that right after these. Football on Off The Ball In association with the faster than ever Boyle Sports app Multiples made easy And personalised content on every sport Download it now Boyle Sports, time to play There you go Your mum's messages And a fiver change for her Oh, thanks Jim I'll be keeping that change to cover my expenses Many people have money taken from them Without their permission it's called financial abuse. Could this be you? Safeguarding Ireland. 
promoting the rights of vulnerable adults. Safeguidingireland.org Ferco windows and doors keep the heat in and the burglars out. Guaranteed. See ferco.ie This is Harry, Barry and Gary, the hottest app developers in town. Working from their bedrooms, they keep their customers happy whilst keeping their costs down. With eReceptionist, the guys have a real 01 Dublin landline number which then forwards to their mobiles. They each have their own extension linked to their personal schedule so when Harry's on a date with Carrie, his calls forward to Gary and Barry. Want to look super professional and stay connected? Get eReceptionist instantly. Free for 30 days at ereceptionist.ie what awaits at Dublin's most exhilarating new experience? Oh, Banshee is trouble. Big trouble. Get to the vaults. Find out how you'll feel. Immerse yourself in six Irish stories. Don't lose your head. Filled with thrills, laughs. So we Vikings built Dublin. Flat pack style. History. Thursday is no execution day in Dublin. And you. Opens 19th of October. Book right now at vaults.live. <gasps> the vaults. It's one hell of a live experience. It's 20 years since Livy Valley Shopping Centre first opened its doors. That's 20 years of shopping, dining and fantastic entertainment. We've come a long way with over 80 stores, 20 restaurants and a 14 screen cinema. And we've lots of exciting plans for the future. We'll be celebrating our birthday in style with a host of giveaways and an exclusive party just for you. All will be revealed soon. So come and join the party at Liffey Valley. 20 years and still growing. We've come a long way in the last 25 years. From all being part of Jackie's army to following Martin's men. From nights in with Gabo to Netflix and chill. From cups of tea in the kitchen to matcha lattes on the go. go. From getting the shift to having to swipe right. And from Skoda being a funny sounding name to being one of the country's favourite car brands. And we wouldn't change a thing. Celebrating 25 years in Ireland. Skoda. Made for Ireland. It's time to party, have fun and save big at Harvey Norman. We're celebrating 15 years in Ireland and 15 years of great value and service with a 15th birthday sale. Get the Samsung fridge freezer with no frost technology and all-round cooling, which keeps your food fresher for longer for just €529, saving you €200. Celebrate and save with us today. The Harvey Norman 15th birthday sale, now on. Football on Off The Ball. In association with the faster than ever Boyle Sports app for exclusive price enhancements on the biggest games around. Download it now. Boyle Sports. Time to play. You're welcome back. John Giles is still on the line. John, I want to talk about the goal that Ireland conceded on Tuesday night from Harry Arter's pretty reckless foul to Darren Randolph taking that unnecessary sidestep to his left and particularly the way the wall for the free kick fell apart. Is that somewhat symbiotic of the wider disorganisation that seems to be there around the team? Well, well, it certainly wasn't uh, well organised for the for the for the goal, uh, the free kick, uh, Nathan. Because Martin did uh, actually was very critical of Arthur afterwards. He said, "I told all the players not to do a silly free kick uh, around the edge of the box to be very very careful," which is the right instructions. And Arthur's tackle was bad, but you don't have to concede the goal from it. There was a lot happened after the free kick was given. Uh, and that, that takes the wall, uh, bring the wall into it, because Robinson was in the end of the wall, and if everybody's, anybody's ever watching it again, what you do in the wall, uh, the wall stays where it is until the free kick has been taken. In other words, that's there to block a shot. Mm. That's, its own, that's only common sense. It's there to block a shot, and the keeper lines them up on one side so as he can protect the other side of the goal. In Robinson's case, as Wilson was run, running up to take the he broke from the wall, towards the ball, as if he was not going to, uh, sort of break, breaking it down. But actually, when you look at it now, the, 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 the ball actually went over this position that Robinson's head would have been in if he stayed where he was. But the first thing you do when you're organizing a free kick like that, you make sure that the wall doesn't break. The wall is the wall to stop a direct shot from the free kick. If and when the wall breaks, like Robinson did, you don't have a wall anymore. And that's how Randolph was caught out, because he's protecting the other side of the goal, and he's taken two st- steps to the left. Uh, and the ball goes over the position that Robinson's head would have stopped it. Yeah, but, but so John, Randolph has no chance in it, uh, Nathan, to be honest. 
Can the management team be blamed for that? For oh, Callum yeah. Robinson not holding oh, his yeah. position? Oh yeah, that's, that's organisation during the week when you get together and you're doing exercises in defensive walls. That's what you do. And the, Well, this is what my take on it was that I always tried to do was that that's the wall. You do not break. You're there to block that direct shot. You don't break. If you, if you break, there's no wall anymore. So you stay where you are and you make yourself as big as you can and, and you see the lads jumping sometimes when they're going to kick it. In Robinson's case, he broke from the wall. He was two yards from the wall when the ball went over his head. But if you ever look at the video again, the ball actually goes over the position that Robinson's head would have been in. But that's organization. You make sure that doesn't break. It's like short corner kicks, Nathan, that we've conceded quite a few. Mm. You never, ever let the opposition take a short corner kick against you. You take advantage. Let's put it this way. When you, with your team, you take every advantage you can. If they go asleep, you take advantage of it. But you never go to sleep. So it changes games. We've lost goals from short corner kicks. One in Scotland, a very important one. Actually, yeah. the first goal against Denmark uh, last year was a short corner kick. That should never happen, ever, from day one. So it means if it happened once and happened again, it hasn't been put right. And that's all part of organisation. When you look at the last 20 minutes of the game then, and Ireland threw the kitchen sink at Wales, they brought on Shawnee Maguire, Scott Hogan, ended up almost with a... 2-4-4 four, four formation with Shane Duffy playing as a striker as well. Yeah. Is that a needs must? Martin O'Neill is desperate to get back into this game to keep our hopes of avoiding relegation, of improving seedings alive? Yeah. Or is that the sort of last panicked movements of a man who really doesn't know what's going on? Well, I think Martin, I think Martin does that anyway. Now, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be my uh, way of doing it, uh, Nathan, because... I think I always believe that what's, right, what's the right thing in the first 10 minutes is the right thing in the last 10 minutes. You keep doing what you consider to be right. I don't believe in the big centre-half going up there. Like, if you go back, I'll just go off, the, off a little bit. We go back to Fergie time, when Manchester United score more late goals than anybody else. Mm. And the reason they did that, not because they put a big centre-half up there, they kept playing, they were patient, they did the right things. Now, in the, in the match the other night, of course we're looking for goals, uh, but there's a way of doing it. And, like, Wales, uh, the other night, actually could have scored another three goals Yeah. when we were pressing up the field. That's, I think that's desperation stuff. And the point, I think, there is you keep your head. It's a difficult thing to keep your head and do the right things. But if you look at Manchester United and all the, all the great teams, they did that because they kept their discipline, they kept doing the right things. I don't believe it's throw them up there and throw the ball in there. I just don't believe it. I don't think it works, uh, and I think we could have conceded, conceded another two goals. You keep doing the right things all the time and keep your head. Okay, you can make the substitutions. There's no problem with that, Nathan. But play them in the positions that the lads have come off, or maybe put an extra centre-forward there, but not thrown, thrown everything in there and thrown the big centre-half up there. Wales with the breaks the other day, they should have, it could have finished up 4-1. Yeah, I easily. guess, I guess that's where... we didn't actually create a chance, did we? No. From, from, from the players uh, chucking it in there. Yeah. Not really. People, I guess, misremember Fergie time and as the years have gone on, think it's just throwing as many men forward as possible and forget that actually Manchester United rarely, if ever, conceded a goal Never. when they were pushing men forward at yeah, the end of the game. Yeah, you had goals, you had Keane, you had these guys, keep playing it, keep mm. playing it, complain. That didn't happen by accident. That was the manager insisting. And these were young players coming into the tournament at Manchester United, but Fergie always... Keep playing, push it, keep in your positions, keep playing. If it's the right thing in, in, the, la in the first minute, it's the right thing in the last minute. And that, that paid, I'm only mentioning him because he was the master of it for keeping the dis It's very difficult to see players, naturally, when they go a goal down at night near the end, want to chase forward in silly positions. And players play in silly positions. Oh, we need a goal, we need a goal. I'll be of course, the you need a goal. Yeah. But the best way to do it is to keep your head, keep playing, keep doing the right things. If it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do at any stage in the match. And throwing the big centre half up, it works now and again, but most times it, it doesn't. You're more likely to concede a goal. We've had almost a year now of pretty intense speculation about Martin O'Neill's future, and it's only intensified yet again. But he was quite bullish after the game. There were some really interesting quotes in this morning's newspapers yeah. in a piece that was off mic where... He basically said when he was asked about qualification, which is listen, there's still a hell of a long way to go with the way the Euro 2020 qualifiers are set up. He said, I will win. Why? Because I'm good. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, self, self, 
I was always told when I was a kid, South Prez is no recommendation, uh, <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> you know, Martin has to do the job. Okay, he's in a difficult position. He might turn around. He, 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 I, 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 wouldn't say, I, I don't think it's right to be bullish in this particular situation. Actually, what he's saying was, well, look, it doesn't matter whether we're in, uh, you know, third seed mm. or fourth seed. Uh, we've done it before than that. But the idea of this competition, our big team, is actually to go up the seeding. Yeah. I would think. I think it's a big advantage. Obviously, that's the way we've always tried to over the years uh, to win the matches, win the friendly matches, so you're seeded and make the draw a little bit e- on paper a little bit easier for for yourselves. But uh, you know, Martin is dismissing that now. Say, well, it does. I don't care. Like wh- where we're seeded, we still have the job to do, which is it's a positive uh, <laughs> approach in many ways. It I is. Wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was realistic, but it's uh, it's, it's it's positive if you want to be positive. So from the 1-0 win in Wales last year, Ireland have only won one game since then, a friendly against the USA. When you look at it now, do you think O'Neill and Keane should be given the opportunity to lead Ireland into the qualifiers, the proper qualifiers when they start in March? Or does it feel as though the air has gone out of the balloon, that we just need a change, that we need something to reinvigorate Irish football? I I think it needs to be reinvigorated, uh, Nathan, but I'm not so sure it would be the most... uh, uh, Best, I don't sure it would be the best thing to do to change the management team at this particular time. Why? It, well, it's difficult to know. Uh, you know, are they, are they going to pick it up? Are they, do they know better than anybody else? Are they going to win a few matches? It can happen. And then you say, no, okay, we'll get Joe Bloggs in. Now you're taking a gamble as well. You know? Mm. Like I, 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 I think it's probably, I'd say that probably the right thing, time to make the change was immediately after the last uh, qualifiers and give the new manager a real chance through these competitions and that to build a team to go to the, uh, uh, to the next stage. Yeah. I think, you know, I think, I think the, the present uh, manager team, they're, they're, they don't have the confidence of the people now. They're in a very, very, very difficult position, I think. Yeah, so you don't think that there's a quick fix that actually there's a manager out there who can come in and get another 25, 30% well, well, out of these players? There's a lot to be said for that as well. Now, I'm, I'm sort of hedging my me, hedging me bets here a little bit. Come on, John, get off the fence. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot to be said for that as well, Nathan. Now, you know, it's, 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 it, to be quite honest, picking a new manager and deciding what's the best thing to do, I would hate for my life to be on the, on the line making that, those particular decisions. Certainly, now, Martin is bullish now at the moment, uh, but, you know, the time to be bullish is, is the last few weeks when we've been actually playing well. So I, I, there's not much credit in the bank. Mm. Let's put it that way, Nathan. But I'm not so sure whether it would be correct at this particular stage to make a change or not. Fair enough. We... I wouldn't be sure. I probably would go, I'd probably go on the side of making a change. All right. You, would, you actually think, when you think about it then, that maybe the better option right probably. now slightly is that we do probably. make a change in management. Um, yeah. We're going to wrap it up. We do have a comment in on Facebook, John, saying, dust the boots off, John. Could you do, we could do with a player like you again. Would you fancy it if... Uh, if you were there, late twenties, do you think you could make a real impact on a team like this, or is it just a is it with that management team, with the setup, with finding out a team an hour beforehand, would it be more hassle than it's worth? Well, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to know, Nathan. I don't know. Uh, I'd, I'd, let's put it this way: I'd love to have the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't we all? Wouldn't we all, John? Great stuff as always. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Nathan. Join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. At Seat, we know you're on the move all the time. Up, down, fast, slow. So what about a car that moves you? Available with advanced full-link technology and wireless phone charging. Alert with pedestrian monitoring and blind spot detection. Stylish with full LED lights and interior ambient lighting. Made possible with extremely low monthly repayments and scrappage of up to €5,000. Tempted? The 191 Seat range. Make your move. Visit seat.ie 191. Terms and conditions apply. Smile if you're an Electric Ireland electricity and gas customer. Because, compared to being with other suppliers, you're saving up to €806 Euro with us, excluding year one discounts, giving you the best long-term savings over three years. Search Electric Ireland price check and see how much you're saving. Because being with Electric Ireland is smart, staying with us long-term is smarter. Electric Ireland, that's smarter living. 
Conditions apply. Estimated annual bill is €1,673. Year one discounts excluded. Dual fuel, direct debit and online billing. Residential customers only. See comparison at electricireland.ie forward slash price check. Based on rates at October 1st, 2018. With over €2.5 billion in funds under management, 30,000 investors and nearly 50 years in operation, if you're looking for an award-winning fund manager with exceptional customer service, BCP Asset Management may be right for you. For information on BCP's investment range, contact your financial advisor or visit bcp.ie. BCP, grow your investments, reduce your risk. BCP Asset Management DAC, trading as BCP, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. It's the security of knowing that if an alarm is triggered, there's a rapid response by trained professionals. Top security. The sign of security. October 26th is polling day. On that day, you will be asked to vote on a change to our constitution. The question is about whether or not we remove the wording that requires blasphemy to be a criminal offence. To get all the facts from a clear and independent source before you make up your mind, go to refcom.ie. Everything your vote means is explained there. Because on October 26th, your vote means everything. Brought to you by the Referendum Commission. What you need is a real hub. Brady Family Hub. 100% Irish. 100%. A ham requiring no passport, no visa, no airline ticket, nor excess baggage allowances. You won't find Brady Family Ham at the arrival gates. For Brady Family Ham is no international traveller. So book your trip to the chilled cabinet and look for the ham less travelled. Brady Family Ham. Always 100% Irish. Always low food miles. Autumn, my favourite time of the year. Cosy nights by the fire, leaves falling on the ground and prices falling in the autumn sale. Yep, summer may be over, but the bargains are just beginning at appliancesdeliver.ie with up to 20% off washing machines, up to 25% off dishwashers and up to 30% off tumble dryers and cooking. And for those long nights in, binging on box sets and stuffing your face with chocolate, there's also up to 20% off TVs. The autumn sale ends soon at appliancesdelivered.ie On 106 to 108 FM and at newstalk.com This is News Talk. Good evening, I'm Tom Swift. A jury has cleared Roma fan Filippo Lombardi of engaging in a joint attack that left Liverpool fan Sean Cox with severe brain injuries. Following his acquittal, Mr Lombardi was jailed for three years for a separate charge of violent disorder. Our court's correspondent, Frank Graney, reports from Preston Crown Court. Footage showing a group of Roma fans flooding into an area populated by Liverpool supporters on their way to watch their Champions League clash last April was shown to the jurors during this trial. Filippo Lombardi admitted being out front of that group and insisted he was lost and simply looking for the entrance to Anfield's away supporter section. Sean Cox had travelled from Dunboyne County Meath to watch the game with his brother Martin. He suffered catastrophic injuries when he was punched to the ground by another Roma fan. Mr Lombardi was accused of then lashing out with his belt and inflicting grievous bodily harm on Mr Cox, a charge he was cleared of this afternoon after nine hours of jury deliberations. The 21-year-old didn't walk free from court, though. He was jailed for three years for violent disorder, a charge he pleaded guilty to last month. During the trial, the court heard another man has been arrested in relation to what was described as an unprovoked attack on Mr Cox. Frank Graney at Preston Crown Court. Brexit has been described as the political equivalent of climate change by the Taoiseach. Leo Varadkar warned that business leaders won't wait for politicians to reach a deal before making decisions that could profoundly affect Ireland's economy. He added no one has been exaggerating the threat of violence in Northern Ireland if there's a return to a hard border. Earlier, the British Prime Minister Theresa May said lots of work still needs to be done if a deal is to be reached before Christmas. On the withdrawal agreement, there are a few but considerable outstanding issues in relation to the Northern Irish backstop. I'm committed to working with the Commission and EU leaders to resolve these as quickly as possible. There's a lot of hard work ahead. There will be more difficult moments as we enter the final stages of the talks. But I'm convinced that we will secure a good deal that is in the interests of the UK and of the European Union. A rare case of BSE, otherwise known as mad cow disease, has been detected on a farm in Scotland. Restrictions have been placed on the site in Aberdeenshire, while investigations are carried out to identify where it came from. The Scottish Government says there's no risk to human health. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Des Kelly Interiors. Supplying and fitting your new carpet or wood flooring in time for Christmas. DesKelly.ie 
Dry in most areas with some outbreaks of rain and drizzle in the west and northwest. Lowest temperatures 2 to 7 degrees. Mostly dry and cloudy tomorrow, apart from some light rain in the west and north. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. All right, you're welcome back to Thursday's Off the Ball. Nathan with you until 10 o'clock. Andy Lee coming up shortly, looking ahead to the weekend's boxing. And we will talk to Neil Cotter, who is the author of a new book, Dublin, the chaos years, the gory years of Dublin football when they went 16 seasons without winning an All-Ireland title, the glory years as it was for the rest of us. Uh, 53106 is the text number. A text in from the Lucan Lothario, who has been in touch 